to the second year of the Yoga and Meditation Society. I am Dr. Ashok Mohotra. I'm a member of the philosophy department at Suni Uniyanta. I'm also the chair of the Yoga and Meditation Society. The Yoga and Meditation Society is funded by the ISA grant from Meta Nexus Institute, as well as a grant from Suni Uniyanta. Today we have uh, a wonderful speaker from India. Her name is Dr. Rita Sinha Dasgupta. She is a professor of philosophy, education. She has a wonderful background uh, in uh, the sciences. She has a master's degree in chemistry, a master's degree in education, a master's degree in philosophy, as well as a PhD degree in education. And it's amazing background. And our society, yoga society, tries to start a dialogue between science and religion, as well as philosophy. And we welcome you to our SUNY Onianta campus. Along with the, you, we have also Dr. Schrader, who is a distinguished teaching professor at SUNY Onianta. He and I will be asking you some very simple questions, because our audience are there is also an audience who is very curious about yoga, and they're also interested in education. They want to see how you tie these two things together. So just tell us uh, about uh, uh, how you got involved with uh, yoga and how you got involved with education and how you brought these two things together. Actually, education means all-round development. It's total development so that a person can become physically fit, mentally healthy, emotionally stable, socially adjusted, culturally refined, spiritually enlightened, and of course he has to be intellectually alert. And yoga helps in developing all these abilities. Yoga helps a person to become, think good, look good, feel good and live good. To lead a good life, yoga helps a person. Not only good living, that means having all the material goods like fridge, TV, tape recorder, car, but not only good living, but good life. How to become a good human being. How to enhance his consciousness from lower level to higher level. Because higher values emerge at higher level of consciousness, uh -huh. like truth, beauty, goodness, honesty, fellow feelings, sincerity, all these values we have to acquire through yoga and education. Okay, tell us, you know, people talk about yoga mm. in the United States at so many different levels, mm. and uh, the term has been kicked around, practice has been watered down to such a point that uh, if a curious student wants to know about what the authentic yoga is, they find it very, very hard to look at this uh, entire field out there. Because there are thousands of uh, people who have declared themselves to be yogis, they know yoga. Mm. So how do you suggest that a person should find out what the authentic yoga is? Mm. Actually, yoga means union. <clears throat> it is the union of the individual self with the universal self. We have to establish this union and derive energy from the universal self. In our Upanishads, it is written, I am quoting in Sanskrit. Okay. Which means, eternal energy is contained in particles smaller than the smallest, in the same way as it is contained in things bigger than the biggest. Uh -huh. Another two lines from the Upanishads, Om Purna Madah Purna Medam Purna Artu Purna Mudachate Purnasya Purna Madaya Purna Meva Vashishate, which means infinity plus infinity is equal to infinity, infinity minus infinity is equal to infinity. That we can prove mathematically. Uh -huh. So if in all the aspects of uh, Upanishads, we have this scientific background. We have science behind it. 
infinite is there. If you take out something from the infinity, infinity will remain the same. So a person has to establish his union with the infinite self. Finite individual has to establish union with the infinite, that is yoga. Okay, but still, give us a scientific example, mm. because it's still uh, very, it's unclear. Uh -huh. We understand infinity added to infinity uh -huh. gives infinity, in infinity minus infinity. Exactly. But what is a practical example? Uh -huh. uh, see if you can tell it's us, so that it's something very concrete so people can understand. Actually, when we gain knowledge, we gain through our senses, like eyes, ear, nose, by touching. So all the educationists, they have given importance on the training of senses. Up to this level, it is their senses. Right. Here it is risen, logical thinking, rational thinking, analytical thinking. And if we move even beyond, that is reflection, knowledge through reflection, knowledge through insight, knowledge through intuition. We can, say, we can give examples from science. We can stretch a light quantum photon, but that stretching is within space and time. We can stretch a DNA molecule, that will be within space and time. But in human beings, Kundalini can be stretched beyond space and time to get uh, pure knowledge which manifests pure knowledge. Okay. Now you used a difficult term here, Kundalini. Oh. Now in India people know the meaning <laughs> of the term Kundalini. Now Kundalini mm -hmm. uh, has many different meanings mm -hmm. to it, but one of the meanings is that the cosmic energy, mm -hmm. cosmic consciousness resides in each creature, mm -hmm. including human beings. Including and in human beings, this cosmic energy is coiled up mm -hmm. as a human conscious potential mm. and that's lies somewhere near the belly button mm. and that conscious potential has to be awakened through yoga through meditation mm. and that's what you are really trying to say right. that let's awaken it so how do you actually awaken that um, actually kundalini is pure conscious energy but it is in sleeping form it is in dormant form it okay. is in hidden form. Right. We have to awaken it. We have to develop it. We have to enhance it. And only human beings on the planet Earth, they stand vertically on the ground with their spinal cord in vertical position. So they can awaken their Kundalini from lower level to higher level. Okay. And in this way, they can gain pure knowledge. They can manifest pure knowledge about the universe. And if they go beyond this level, they can have knowledge through intuition, knowledge through reflection, knowledge through insight. Even several scientists, they had knowledge through intuitive flashes. Okay. For example, Kekuli saw the structure of benzene. Uh -huh. Before that, people had knowledge of only straight chain compounds. Benzene was having the formula C6H6, that right. means six carbons and six hydrogen. Uh -huh. Carbon is having four bonds, hydrogen one, but through the straight chains, all the bonds were not satisfied. So Kekuli was thinking and thinking, and he had a dream. In his dream, he saw a snake is biting its tail and making a ring-like structure. So he jumped up with the conclusion that benzene might be having a ring-like structure with alternate double and single bond. Uh -huh. So this entire organic chemistry is based on this structure of benzene, and which Kekuli de derived through insight, through intuitive knowledge, through intuition. So you're really trying to say hmm. that uh, what the yoga philosophers called Kundalini Shakti, hmm. Kundalini power, Kundalini hmm. consciousness, that's the divine spark residing in a potent form, potent form. in a latent form, mm -hmm within each human being or innate right. form right. and through the yogic exercises human being which is the being which stands up erect mm. uh, there are different centers in our human body they are mm. called the chakras right. that is they are the energy centers they are like uh, uh, we can say uh, little pivotal points mm. in our body 
uh, starting with our sexual organs or even below mm. uh, and sexual organs and then our uh, belly button and then going to our heart then to the throat mm. then uh, to our mm. uh, uh, forehead mm. and then finally the seven is so the goal is to help this kundalini power to rise through all of these uh, little centers which we call chakras, chakras. to distribute energy mm. and yoga takes you step by step and the bottom two levels are the levels which we may call uh, the levels we share with the animals mm. uh, uh, the, all the way up to the belly button we are still animals Animal or a little bit a human being a little bit an animal and when we come to the heart level then we really generally become compassionate mm. human beings so we are saying yoga and meditation helps you to go through all these and finally come up to the point mm -hmm. which could be this level this of level, chakra yeah. or this. And most of the scientists who have been able to make all these wonderful discoveries, mm -hmm. which we call insights, which we call uh, discoveries, mm -hmm. are, they are able to do it because they have their own system of meditation, their own system of concentration, concentration. through which they are able to summon up this power, awaken this energy, right. and give us all these insights. Mm -hmm. So most of the scientific discoveries really could be explained through this concentrated effort on the part of the scientist. Because the intellectual and spiritual ability of a person is not just move revolving in a circle, but it is evolving by the sides of a parabola. It is evolving to a higher plane. That is why most of the scientific discoveries, they move at a higher plane. That means not only this biological creativity, but from biological creativity, they move towards aesthetic creativity, still higher. Then they move towards intellectual creativity. They discover a law, discover a theory. For example, everybody saw that apple is falling from the tree, but it was only Newton who could say that it is because of gravity. Perhaps it is through intuition, through intuitive flashes, he was able to say. Yeah. I'd like to, uh, to, mm. to pursue this a little further, uh, mm. if, if I may. Um, if I understand you correctly, um, uh, the basis of many scientific discoveries, um, so, such as uh, Kekulé's discovery mm. of the molecular structure of benzene, um, come in, a, in, a, in an intuitive um, flash that doesn't fit within what we normally teach as the scientific method. Mm. That is, how do you do science? Well, you, uh, in the words of uh, Thomas Huxley, you sit before nature as a small mm. child um, waiting to see what it will teach you. Or you do a series of experiments. Um, um, Newton's uh, famous uh, hypothesis non fingo, I don't form hypotheses, I don't make any guesses about the way things are. Um, if I understand you correctly, you suggest that if we cultivate meditation um, as part of the training of scientists, that they will be more open to seeing the world differently and thereby um, open up parts of their intellect, parts of their, uh, their consciousness uh, that would allow them to make discoveries that they wouldn't if we simply keep them in the lab as much as we currently do. Actually, scientific knowledge is very systematic, very logical thinking, rational thinking is involved in scientific knowledge. But even then, scientific theories are either alterable or falsifiable. Whatever true today may not be true tomorrow. So knowledge cannot remain fresh like a fish, which White had said once remarked. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it is continuously changing. And if we think deeply, if we develop our concentration, we can try to find out the ultimate truth, the ultimate reality. Many persons can develop this concentration from the very beginning, and they can discover truth. They can discover laws. For example, Kekuli was a small child. When he, the, sorry, Ke, not Kekuli, Goss was a great mathematician. When he was a small child, yeah. he entered the school, and the teacher used to say, add all the numbers from 1 to 10, mm -hmm. then 1 to 15, then 1 to 20. And Goss 
added all these numbers very quickly. The teacher, even it took time for the teacher to calculate, but right. cause a small boy, he was calculating so rapidly. So the yeah. teacher asked, how could you do it? He said, I have used the formula n by 2 into a plus l, where n is the total number of terms, a is the first term, l is the last term. Right. So he said, I could visualize the formula yeah. through intuition, right. being a small child. That means he was concentrating a lot. Perhaps that is the reason why he was able to discover this right. formula. And, and this brings us back very nicely to the to the concept of education and uh, in your book, yeah, a wonderful uh, book, mm. education, education at the dawn of uh, new millennium. Right. Um, when, when you talked about education earlier, you talked about uh, a development of the person, of the self, of becoming uh, mm. a better person. Mm. Um, when, when we think of education, we also think in terms of a uh, imparting of information uh, to learn that 2 plus 2 is 4 or that the molecular structure of benzene is hexagonal or, or whatever it is that you happen to be learning. Right. Um, and um, and the, the notion of the development of a self, of, de of becoming a better right. person through education is, is really a different sort of notion. So I wonder if you might speak to that a little bit more. Actually, Swami Vivekananda said, Education is manifestation of perfection already in man. Perfection is there in the man, but it is in sleeping form, dormant form, hidden form. So through, through education, we have to develop it, nurture it, enhance it. Creative potentiality is there in each and every individual, but that has to be developed so that they can become better persons. Higher values emerge at higher level of consciousness. And in education, we are looking forward to develop a world society, world concept, world fellowship. All these ideas emerge in a higher level of consciousness. So education enables a person to widen his range of mind so that he can think in diverse ways. Because intellectual ability is not only just thinking in the same direction, not yeah. revolving in a circle, mm -hmm. but evolve like a parabola. Think in diversified dimensions. Mm -hmm. Think in different dimensions. Right. Think in unique dimensions. Mm -hmm. And develop unique concepts, unique ideas, new concepts, novel thinking. All these things are... Okay, you're talking about here... Our creativity. Education becomes, is more like a fountain which spreads itself in many different ways yeah. and it can flourish and that's what we call creativity yeah. and so forth. But uh, uh, the question here is that yoga helps in the development of uh, this creativity. Yeah. Uh, you have different forms of yoga. Right. And uh, one of them which uh, you are interested in, and that's mantra right. yoga. Mm -hmm. What is that? And tell us a little bit about it, how sounds can yeah. actually affect a person yeah. to help bring out this wonderful creative urge yeah. which human beings have. Actually, mantra is a mystic syllable which yeah. manifests pure knowledge. For example, Om is the supreme mantra, which consists of A-U-M, creation, stability, destruction. So in the universe, everything is in the form of wave. Brain waves are like this, mm -hmm. sound waves are like this. Right. So when we utter a mantra, it is like a sound. For example, in India we find when we, some persons together, they lift a heavy body, heavy object. Right. Together they utter, hayo, hayo, or haisha, or they lift a palanquin, they say huhumna, huhumna. That is a kind of mantra. That means together when they speak, that will create energy. Mm -hmm. Because sound waves that are, are like this. So when two or three persons, they utter the same syllable, it will create energy. It will enhance energy. Enhance energy through, through resonance. Yeah. Because the soldiers, I'm giving one example. The soldiers are not allowed to march over a bridge because so much energy will be created that the bridge might collapse. Okay. <laughs> so in yeah. mantra, we can derive energy. 
by uttering this mantra. Freud said that we, human beings have two kinds of instincts, eros and thanatos. Eros, life instinct, and thanatos, death instinct. Right. But in Om, creation, then stability, then destruction. Destruction is for becoming more and more perfect. That is for perfection. Otherwise, we would have remained in the Stone Age. Scientific development is also required. That is why from Stone Age, we went to agricultural age, then industrial age, then technological age, and now we are moving towards super technology. So this is because of scientific development. But along with that, we must have superhumanism also. We must become superhuman beings. Okay, so we how do you do that when you say that mm. now in technology we have super technology mm. and we're moving in that direction? And there's so much emphasis in the society on technology because mm. technology brings about results. Mm. And they're empirical, you can uh, see them, touch them, and see that happening. Right. Whereas when we are talking about superhumanism, we are talking about super consciousness, we are talking about uh, yoga aiming at uh, uh, bringing out this divine energy. Right. This doesn't seem to be so concrete for people who are so accustomed to concrete <laughs> results. So how do you actually mm. educate them? How do you convince them? Mm. Do you start educating them at the first grade level, second grade, third grade? or sixth grade, or mm. elementary mm. school, or the total high school, and then college. Where do you start that education? Actually, science and technology is very practical. Yes. And it has made our life very comfortable. Yeah. But yoga tells us that not only here we should have survival of the fittest, but we should have peaceful coexistence of everybody, of every individual. Not only individuals, even plants and animals, because in everything there is the supreme consciousness, the infinite uh, energy is there. So we have to think of everything because nature has enough to satisfy our need, but not our greed. With the use of too much emphasis on science and technology, we are wantonly exploiting the nature in this way, the balance, the rhythm, the harmony, the symmetry of the nature is being disturbed. So we have always we have to think of that there must be peaceful coexistence so that this balance remains. If this balance is disturbed, the entire human race will be disturbed. If we are exploiting nature and not thinking about generations to come, there will be pollution problem. We can see that in developing countries like India, we talk about three Ps problem of population, population problem, mm -hmm. yeah. then problem of pollution, then problem of poverty. Yes. And that is why yoga philosophy, they teach us that we have to uh, give our attention to three R's, that is reduce, we must reduce our wants. Right. There must be end to our wants. Reuse, we have to reuse a particular object and recycle. We must know the nature of recycling. Uh -huh. Because for example, the plastic containers, Yes. Uh, we are even now, till, till now we are unable to recycle it yeah. or DDT, certain right. things they yeah. are not biodegradable. Right. So we must think of ways and means to recycle, to maintain the balance, to maintain the rhythm, to maintain the harmony. Right. So what you are really yes. saying is that yoga helps you to raise your consciousness mm. from just thinking about yourself as an individual, as a finite being, to a being who is really interconnected with uh, all other humanity, right. all other forms of life, mm -hmm. not only all other forms of life on this earth, but with the solar system, with the galaxy, galaxy. with the whole universe. Right. And you uh, actually uh, cite an example which I heard when I was growing up in India, that the emphasis here in the West and even now in India mm -hmm. is on individualism, on your uniqueness, mm -hmm. your singularity, how separate you are. And the Buddha said a long time ago, the more separated you are, more anxious you are, more insecure you are, more unhappy you are, more mm -hmm. stressful you are. And there's a wonderful example which you gave also to me, and also I learned that, that we are finite beings, we think we are finite beings, mm -hmm. and there is uh, infinity there. 
we are more like uh, a pitcher, yeah. pitcher, earthen pot, where there is uh, water in it. Right. Up to the time this water is in the pitcher, we think that this pitcher is separate. But this water came out mm. of a, a river. You take this pitcher, put it in the river, and you still are separate right. from the river water. But if you break the outside mm. walls of the pitcher, then that water, little water, will be assimilated into that great right. water. So if we can break the barrier of right. uh, this individualism, which is like that earthen mm. pot, the covering, then we'll be reunited right. with the infinite, with our humanity. So yoga gives you that kind right. of consciousness right. to look at it at a cosmic level, at a global level, mm. at uh, a level where all humanity is nothing more than brothers and sisters right. who are fed by the same mother. If we are if we can raise our consciousness to higher level, we are able to discard our narrow regionalism in favor of globalism, in favor of universalism, in favor of humanism. Right. I am reciting in Hindi. Yes. Jal me kumbh kumbh me jal hai, bahar bhitar pani, tuta kumbh jal jal me samaya, ye tath keh gai gyani. That means there is water in the pitcher. We can say that it is individual self. There is water in the river. That is the universal self. There is difference between these two types of water. Right. But when the pitcher is broken, there is no difference between yeah. this water. That means the individual self has merged with the yeah. universal self. So yes. we, if we are able to merge our consciousness with the universal self, we can think of global village, right. world society, world yeah. concept, world ideas, world faith, yeah. world culture. We can think of a yeah. Single society, world society. That's wonderful. We have just one minute, so Doug, you might uh, have some um, comments. Well, la last yeah. thought. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of the interconnection between technology and meditation, um, uh, you've described a, a, a growth over time. Uh, do you believe that the development of more and more technology separates us from the, uh, the natural world which was conducive to meditation. This, this table in front of us looks like it has a wood grain, but it's made out of vinyl. <laughs> Actually, I don't think that we should stop development. But development, the technological development must include sustainable development, which will be better for the human beings. Along with the technological development, we must also have development of values, higher values in life. Because in the technologically developed societies, higher values in life like honesty, fellow feeling, sympathy, cooperation are being replaced by values like efficiency, smartness, usefulness. And just as a mechanic tends to replace a worn out nut by a new nut, similarly, a behavior technologist tends to replace a less efficient person by a more efficient person. Mm -hmm. In this way, the dehumanization of behavior takes place. So we have to cultivate the habit of practicing yoga so that we are not dehumanized. Right. We don't feel that as if we are isolated. We must feel that we should be integrated. So that is why we must that's, practice yoga. That's wonderful because uh, uh, our time is uh, over. Uh, it's wonderful that uh, you are able to tell us uh, about uh, yoga and education and how science is value free. Yoga can add that dimension of value where the individual takes the central place along with the whole universe of which it is a wonderful integrated part. I uh, thank you very much and okay. thank you, Doug. Thank you. Uh, I say namaste. Namaste. Namaste means I bow before you. My total person bows before you. And as I bow, I bow before that Kundalini Shakti, that power. <laughs> I and too that bow means before you. We are all equal children of this earth. Thank you very much.